Hey guys, uh, welcome, my name's Andy. Uh, this is Jason, we're the studio managers here at British Grove. Uh, welcome to Studio One, uh, where we're currently at. Obviously here with big 96 channel Neve console. It's kind of the heart. It's like the centre point, isn't it? It's um, where the focus of all recordings sort of go through this. We can set it up so it's not the focus. We, and on occasion we've wheeled the TG here and use that as the as the focus point. And even the red, actually, that is yep. coming. Um, um, that one wheels, but this one floats. Studio One is our main tracking room. As you can see through the glass, this is where we do our bigger sessions, good for orchestral work, band work, vocal. We've even done ADR in yeah. there. Uh, so over here, we've got this old RCA. I believe this is a consolette. It's not a console as such. This came out of a sort of got this out of a, another studio uh, and it was not in the best condition. Um, our tech team here who are brilliant built this base for it, made it so it's just completely compatible with sort of modern standards. And it's an old radio consulate, I believe. Yeah, mono, four preamps and then uh, position for a uh, turntable as well. Probably jumping another decade over there, we've got the red console which is the same model that would have been at Abbey Road in the mid 60s. This one didn't come out of Abbey Road. It was uh, uh, in EMI, Italy. Yep. Console, and believe it or not, this is the portable version. Uh, breaks down into five parts. And I think there was like an EMI wheelbarrow for it. And they used to take it around recording orchestras, operas. The low end on it is uh, fantastic. Uh, I don't think there's another piece of gear in the studio that sort of can replicate that. It's just a wonderful bit of gear. Uh, and lovingly restored by Brian Gibson, uh, who's a big part of the tech team here. Uh, this one came out of Lagos uh, in the EMI studio there. It was found behind a dumpster, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, Brian lovingly restored it. Um, it's all original spec on it. Again, it's all brought up to modern standards so we can interface and, and patch into it just uh, like any other bit of gear here. This, I personally, if I'm engineering, I use it on almost every session. It's just incredible. Uh, the preamps on it are just out of this world on drums, the compressor limiters as well. Yeah. It is, even by today's standards, like it's quite high tech. It's got um, compressor limiters and a pretty comprehensive EQ. So that's about it for consoles. Let's talk about some of the outboard. We have a lot of it in this room. The original idea with the outboard in both studios was it would somewhat mirror each other. Um, so there's a lot of things in here that there might not be an exact equivalent, but this here is an old Decker limiter. Uh, it's type P, which the P is for prototype, I believe, uh, with the magic eye. We call this like the, the clean, <laughs> the clean pre-rack. So we've got like, the Mazalek um, MMA4s, which are like beautiful, transparent um, preamps, um, as well as the Broadest Gardens. Um, they they measure like ridiculously and, and like flat up to crazy frequency. Some of the staples, you know, like 1176s, LA2A, distresses, uh, DBX 160s, 33609s. 33609s. Yeah, it's a lot of flames. Obviously, we've got the Fairchild as well, which is uh, amazing. Uh, we've got this one, and we've got another one in studio too. So two Procastes in each room, um, 480, 960, TC 6000. We have two um, EMT plates up in our tech room. Uh, a transistor per studio. Per studio. Um, so a transistor and a valve option, controllable from here. The most important thing with a lot of this gear, especially the older stuff, is it all works and it's all available on our patch. I think there's a lot of times, a lot of studios I've been in where they've got a lot of funky old gear, it looks great, and maybe sounds good, but you know, you might get a couple of takes and it starts frying or, or just goes down on a session. The tech team here are just incredible at keeping this stuff going and if it doesn't sound good by a mo you know, like a modern standard. We're not interested in just like having it for the sake of having it. Everything in here works. This whole studio was built with musicians in mind. It's supposed to be the best for everyone. So for engineers, this is a great place to work. This is a lovely room to be in. But we've got the, uh, you know, the full length glass there. 
The visibility into the room is great for communication with musicians. We're very fortunate that this place was, you know, helped in part designed by musicians um, and with people in general who've got, I don't know, like 60, 70 years worth of hindsight in terms of studio design. Yeah, that was one of the things Mark was really looking for when this sort of, when he was sort of was imagining a studio that he might build. It's like, I want to be able to track with all my great band all at once, have isolation, great sight lines. So it's all, it's all to be as like natural and, and as comfortable as possible when you're playing. Yeah. Um, so that's why we've, we've got quite a lot of booths. Uh, I think it's seven in total as yeah. standard. It can be configured as one large booth or three individual ones. Yeah. Um, and even down to like the monitoring, we have, um, you can see it, there's one neatly tucked under the desk there for the Pro Tools operator, but we have a load of these um, British Grove Q systems, which is um, a totally analog private mixer system for each musician. So you can feed it um, up to eight mono inputs, two stereos, but technically actually you could do three um, via an AUX broadcast system that we designed for it. Every musician has their own like private mix, which is usually yeah. a good thing. Sometimes it's not, but um, <laughs> in, in, in general, it means that they have a, a, a mix that's custom and tailored to them, as well as being able to play all at once with all their sort of isolation that you need from amps or individual players in booths um, means you can get a really great take yeah. really, really quickly. And as well, having the, such a big Neve console helps with that. It's, I mean, it's a very big Neve, but we end up using a lot of the real estate on a lot of sessions because there's a lot of times where we're trying to make the recording session as invisible for the musician as possible so they can focus on playing and being creative. So we might have, say, a band set up on the first 24, but then we need to transition into a, maybe a string session for the band, but we're not having to repatch stuff because we've already got, you know, all the mic lines ready for that session. The control room was originally set up for 5.1 in here, but we updated it to 7.1 initially with the 150s at the side. We did that in here first, and then we put that in Studio 2 as well. So both studios started 5.1 ATC, both eventually went 7.1, and then recently we've updated Studio 2 to Atmos, um, ATC full complement as well. Um, our near fields of choice are the ATC's SCM25s. I love them, clients love them, they're amazing. Um, we do have other brands as well um, of monitoring that we can, you know, we, when clients book the studio, they get a, a gear list and you know, they can spec what they want. So there are others, but they, we put them out as standard as, a, as, our, as our first choice. So yeah, uh, through here is Studio One's library, uh, which is a lovely space, double height ceilings. Uh, as Jace mentioned, we've got the booths around the outside. Um, one thing that's amazing about the studio is it's, although the, it appears as one building, there are several different structures, uh, separate buildings that are all linked together. Um, so the booths, uh, I believe this booth, that booth and this booth are completely separate such structures. So isolation, although it's not absolute, it's it's as good as I think you can get. Yeah. It's, um, we can have, you know, the quietest orchestra playing in, in the main space and then you could have a, a guitar amps blaring or a drum kit going in there. Um, so it makes the space incredibly versatile. And as I was saying, in the control room, you can get a lot done at once because uh, you've got the isolation and uh, loads of options available. It's very configurable in terms of acoustics and feel. Um, up here, we have panels that you can flip, which at the moment, they're set to absorption mode, but you can fold them over and they basically reveal a reflective surface. Um, and then the... Um, paddles above, they are currently set in reflective mode, but with a remote, we can actually open those up so they kind of go upwards and reveal the absorption behind them. So with those and rugs and um, Tatrix gobos, we can, you can actually really mold the acoustics to your liking in here. You know, and you, you can even make little like micro acoustic sections so you can make a really dead side and a really live side so it's and we have panels so at the moment the booths are 
completely open in terms of the glass, and that tends to be the way it runs for sight lines. But you know, if you then feel that the booths are slightly too bright or live, we have um, acoustic panels that fit in perfectly in the glass. Booth two is tends to be a drum room, uh, but also we do drums out here quite a lot. Um, booth two is a double height booth. The rest of the booths have a lower ceiling. Uh, we actually also have uh, a couple of pairs of microphones in the ceiling um, pre-configured to get like really nice ambient tones and um, recordings and we have the same in here. What's great about the versatility as well is um, on a lot of band sessions where maybe an album's being recorded, an overall sound they might be like, okay, there's going to be some acoustic tracks, there's going to be some uh, loud rock tracks. They can set up several drum kits, mm -hmm. or maybe one in here which has you know, quite, it's it's not completely dead, but it has a sort of it's got a bit of air to it. Mm. Um, a, a big kit in the room with, you know, sort of traditional big room sounds. And then even like some of the smaller booths, we can get a really dead sound. So jumping between mm -hmm. sessions is so easy. Um, if a band suddenly decide they want the kit to sound like the 60s or the 70s, we can very quickly get that sound for them. Um, and we also have glass through from two to three. So like, you know, if, if, if there's musicians in each of these booths, they're like going back to sight lines and making things feel natural and, and everybody sort of interacting with each other. So, I mean, we should mention the piano because it's beautiful. Uh, Bosendorfer, I think they, they call it an Imperial Grand because of this last octave. Yeah. Um, very warm. Um, yeah, just, it's, it's, it's great. A lot of pianists say they enjoy playing it. Um, and we actually have two uprights that are available as well. Um, a Beckstein and a Knight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the great thing about this is as well, it's on, a, it's on this dolly here, so we can, we can move this between the booths as well. So quite often we'll have a piano going down at the same time as orchestra, um, with the piano boothed off. Uh, and again, it, the, the piano sounds fantastic in the booth. It's such a large object in itself that I think like it doesn't sound dry or unnatural in the booth because it's just such a reverberant instrument in itself. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just a lovely piano. And going back to the booths, um, they can all fold away. So actually, they can all just disappear. You can see booth one, um, which is over here, is currently open, but that actually, the wall kind of pulls out, which will reveal the panels that slide along the, the rail system and then they, they winch down into place and create an acoustic seal. And that's the same for booth two, booth three, and booth four, A, B, and C. So sometimes people just want maximum floor space and we open up all the booths and we just like really fill the room with musicians and really like spread out an orchestra say. Or you know, if you if you want maximum versatility, you have them all set as booths, so you can put an instrument or an amp in each booth and really get isolation. So it goes back to like being able to cater for the session as best as possible. Yeah. Even more ATCs in here. We have a pair of 150s for when we want to do reamping. Sometimes people like come in with some recordings that they've already done and they want to reamp kick and snare or or they want to further embellish things they've recorded in here, the tracks are in a booth and then they want to take some of the room, um, but also they're great for just playbacks. I mean, one thing I like about it again is quite often, say we've decided to put some drums in that booth, uh, then the decision is made that, you know what, maybe it is a bit too dry and we want some, some energy in the drums. Uh, this booth can open up very quickly and we can put some room mics out here and then you've got fabulous control over sort of a very live sounding kit, a very dry sounding kit. So this is our Studio 2. This room is predominantly a mix room, I'd say, nowadays. Yeah. However, it does have a small booth where you can do vocals, guitars, and we've had drum kits in there. We've recently uh, kitted it out for Dolby Atmos. 
So we have 714 in here. It sounds fantastic. Um, it's, it's nice to have a different flavor in this room in terms of the desk. Uh, obviously it's not as current as the, uh, the Neve console, but um, it serves the purpose of the room perfectly. Uh, it's a lovely desk to work on. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I've spent many an hour in this room <laughs> and uh, it's always, a, a, you know, a favorite of a lot of people, I think, for mixing yeah. in London. Yeah, it tends to, we tend to get quite a few projects that start the project in Studio One tracking, because our main tracking space. And then, you know, when, when film projects started to mix through consoles less and steer it more in the box and maybe stem through consoles, um, or just stay completely in the box, they bring the project into this room. And we've actually had it where we've got a mix going on in here whilst the project is still tracking in Studio One. So it becomes a bit of a hub for the movie. So it's almost like a, a conveyor belt. Um, strings get recorded, pulled into here, mixed. The speakers in here are the same footprint as uh, Studio One. And the outboard is relatively the same. And initially it was pretty much mirrored, wasn't it? But mm -hmm. um, it's, it's grown and varied over time. Uh, but moving from one room to the other feels quite seamless, I think, going from tracking to mixing, if, if that's the case for a project. Uh, in here we've got the, the 1073s, but in Studio One we've got the 1081s. So all the outboard trolleys are all hooked up on DL points, which all point to a similar place. So actually, you could pull these trolleys and have them at the side of the room if you want, and it just with a few patch label changes, it all interfaces with the patch. Or Similarly, the TG that is in Studio One can be wheeled through into here and just plug up on a DL system and be a part of this room. I mean, it's to the point where you can, we can have a client in here who's tracking in Studio One and using this control room as, as the main control room for one, or both control rooms can be in use uh, for a project in one, or just the entire studio can just become one big yep. tracking space. Um, We've even used this control room as a booth, essentially. We've yeah. had, we've had, we took the trolleys out to the side, had a line of amps in here, and it was an extra booth for Studio One because we've already got seven booths. Having even more booths <laughs> is kind of ridiculous, but that project needed it, so we sort of did it. Overall, in, uh, as far as these sort of consoles go, this one is very well behaved. The EQs, in particular, take a little bit of TLC every now and again, but they, they sound fantastic, so they're worth the effort. Originally, this room was a 5-1 room when it, when it was built. Demands grew, we went to 7-1, so we put the 150s up on the sides to get to 7-1. I suppose it's, whilst we're talking about this, it's worth mentioning this crazy rail system that we've got, which is all to do with the fact when it was built and they were specking the ATCs, they come up with this idea. It's like, well, how about we have them be able to move? <laughs> Worked out a way of doing it so these things can actually move. They're locked into place currently, I yeah, believe. Yeah, you can literally just move them with your hand like that. But if they're unlocked, they move just so like smoothly. You can probably push it with a finger, um, which allows you that variability and the configurability to kind of get the angle you want. And the beauty of that then meant the 7-1 configuration we had, we could get within Dolby spec. So all we really had to add to get to 714 Atmos was just to put the, the 45s in the ceiling. I say just. Yeah, it was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty scary taking the ceiling. We, after we kind of had it all set up and we, we did the first Dolby lineup and we pressed play on that first Dolby Atmos mix, we were all just completely blown away. Yeah. It was, it was really incredible. As we go through to the booth. <laughs> so yeah, the machine rooms here, the, again, they're, they're somewhat mirrored. They're, they are in terms of uh, the patching. Uh, currently we have this set up for some transfers. We've got the Dolby's here. Um, I, can't remember, the, I can't remember what the next transfer is. I think it's 24 track tape uh, with Dolby. So we've got the machines ready for that. The way the studio set up with DLs as well, it's very easy to do that quickly with uh, Pro Tools as well, you know, recording straight to tape, but monitoring through Pro Tools so we can quickly put things down into Pro Tools if the client suddenly wants to start going into overdub land. Um, we all, also, they're all synced up with these old links timelines, so uh, we can get multiple machines going at once, uh, which does still happen. Yeah, yeah, if, like, more often than you'd think. Um, I mean, Mark still likes to put most of his material through tape at some point. 
but they can all be configured slightly differently, which means we can get to the result people want faster, like one setup of a 24 track head block, and have one setup of a 16 track. We have some other. Yeah, I've got an eight track head block yeah. for one of them as well. Yeah, so like, really depending what people want, we can get there quicker because each machine is set up slightly differently. Because um, they all do take a little bit of lining up beforehand. Mm. But. Uh, so this room, uh, yeah, it's smaller booth than Studio One, obviously. Um, the idea, I believe, it was based off a room that Mark liked to write in at one of his houses. Acoustically, it's a very interesting space. It's not just your standard dead booth. Uh, it definitely has a sound, but what's great about it is we can change that with these baffles. So currently it's quite dead in here, uh, but if we turn these around, uh, it's got a reflective side, and suddenly it's more sort of yeah, like a, a live room, which can be great uh, recording things like acoustics in here or, or occasionally drums. You're not just like stuck with a dead sound. You also have got quite an interesting sort of sonic signature in here. It kind of goes back to that like, configurability and versatility that I think sort of permeates the design and the setup. Uh, thank you for coming and looking around the studio of us today. Um, hopefully we'll see you back here soon.